Dave, hello. Do you want to unmute? Trying to. Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, so I was thinking what you were talking about with the hindrances mm -hmm. um, before the meditation. And could you see like the hindrances as, as the negative side of a positive thing? Or are they just always negative? As in, could sort of worry and flurry kind of be a flip side of being quite well organized? But you're trying to get you just kind of get the negative bit of that quality. Oh, I mean, in many respects, yes, uh, because in the instance of worry and flurry, if you have a resolution to the worry, then there is no further requirement to worry. Yeah. You know, so it, it the problem with worry is that it never resolves. There's always the intention to resolve it through thinking about it, but it never actually reaches reaches a point of resolution that and it's there that we have to see the emptiness of the worry yeah yeah so we, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater in that sense so so yes there's also a positive aspect of all the hindrances which is how are we going to gain wisdom into their true nature if we're not willing to look at them so you know they, they are actually performing a really wonderful... I, I said to the people on Wednesday evening at the meeting on Wednesday, that if, if you wake up at 3.30 in the morning and you have a lot of anxiety, you are blessed as a meditator because you have the opportunity to see the emptiness of anxiety, if you so yeah. choose. Or you can indulge it like a mad person to the point where you just drive yourself bonkers. The choice is entirely yours. So this is why mindfully noting something, this is why giving it, you know, naming it as best you can in that moment is so helpful because that begins the process of detaching from it sufficiently, then you can then watch its nature and its nature is in entirely empty. It's insubstantial. It's not relating to anything. It's just, it's just that quality of mind at that moment. That's all it is. It's just blooming in that moment. Yeah. yeah? Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, it's nice to see you. Four of our regulars are on retreat this week, which is great. Um, and Andrew and Nigel obviously having to look after them. So, so yes, up to the rest of you this evening. To dazzle me with your dazzling questions. Les, hello. Greetings. Um, hey. At the moment, my mind is full of a constant stream of, I call it worry, sometimes I call it planning. I'm in the process of moving, so it's a case of I've got a continuous stream of concerns, worries, but then when I think about them, the worry, um, it arises, but it arises because it's come from the past in the sense that in that present moment, I'm aware of it and I'm calling it worry. Mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there observing it. Mm -hmm. And then I become aware of more worry or more concern, more planning. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting there just observing them. Mm -hmm. It's not going away in that sense. It's, it ooh. keeps coming back. Ooh, 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 ooh. ooh. So we have to recognize that when we label something, we tend towards solidifying it and freezing it as a, as a thing. But if you actually are observing it, you see that no object reappears ever, no matter what that object is, whether it's a, a material object, or whether it's a mental object, all phenomena at the ultimate level arise and pass away they do not pass through time. They do not pass through space. Irrespective of appearances, fun, their, their nature is to fundamentally arise and pass away and never return. So what you're experiencing is a whole um, cascade, if you like, a flow of self-similar objects. Yes, they're, they're self-similar. So we give them broadly the, the, the name worry or anxiety or sound or whatever it might be but we've got to look closely to see because we fool ourselves with the labels that we apply 
you know, I was saying to somebody on a retreat this week, uh, today, um, the word dog has no implication of time or tree. There is no implication of time. There is there. It's it's like the concept kind of freezes that object as a as an unchanging entity, and we we have to see that it's it's not. It's a you like worry, dog, tree. These things are not things in themselves. They they are empty of themselves. So a dog is empty of dog, <laughs> and worry is empty of worry. So we have to look at it clearly enough to see that there is a whole set cascade of self-similar objects arising and passing away or passing away. Experience could not occur in any other way. The moment you have um, a frozen moment of consciousness, there is no possibility of a further moment of consciousness. An object does not exist separate from the knowing of it. So there's the arising of the knowing of the, ob the object and the arising of the object, and they're ceasing together. That's the only way conscious experience can work. So although in one sense we say, oh, I've got this issue with worry, or I have an ongoing problem with anxiety. No, <laughs> if you look at it closely, you do not. They're self-similar objects arising that we are clinging to. That's the point, we're clinging to them. We're clinging to them as being me, mine, myself, or we're clinging to them purely in terms of their own self. Not realizing, not seeing that anxiety is empty of itself. It has the appearance, but when you look really closely, you will not find it. And so I, I, I think what happens is with meditation is, is that we still consider, remember what I was saying at the beginning, before the meditation, because we give the worry, some substance. We treat it as though it is a thing, a discrete self-existing thing that, that then has implications. There are implications to the arising of anxiety. There are implications about me, about me as a meditator, having this occurring in my meditation, or whatever it might be. We're giving it substance, we're giving it form, we're giving it life. We're giving it meaning, we're giving it value, which it does not intrinsically have. So the only way through, really, unless, unless we're playing the thing of, you know, like balancing off this particular set of ideas with another set of ideas, which is all valid and fine, but if we're getting down to brass tacks, what we've got to do is allow that worry to be there in order to go through the concept of it and actually experience what is it really? And that's where it starts to break down because it turns out it's only some concepts and a painful feeling. What else is it? If it's something substantial, what is that other aspect to it that I haven't taken into account? Because every time I look at any of these kinds of mental qualities, it all seems to just boil down to a few thoughts and a few feelings. What am I missing? Does anyone know? <laughs> Can you tell me what I'm missing? So, so we we apply, yes, we apply the 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 label to the experience, and we say yes, this this is worry. But can you see how that in, that kind of freezes this idea of this this immovable object? And now I've got to do something with this worry. No, you don't. No, you don't. You let things come. You let things go. Things arise, you know what it is. It's a blooming in that moment. It blooms, it's a, it's, a, it's a finite expression of infinite mystery, whatever it is, including worry, including anxiety. And they've got a, this beautiful message to tell you. <laughs> if, if, and we're training ourselves to be able to, to just sit and allow that message to be brought to us. And the message is not, oh, you've got this on you, these, this set of things to do and th these things could go wrong. That's not the message it's trying to give you. It's trying to tell you that, <laughs> well, you've got to discover it yourself. It's trying to tell you that life is infinitely mysterious, but we're not listening. We're not paying attention. And mindfulness is the remedy for that. So that's a long-winded way of saying, Les. <laughs> 
that, Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you, you've just got to, I think you've just got to relax into, given, you can see why the Buddha suggested to his monks and nuns that they go and live in the forest under a tree. You want to live in another house? Okay, your mind is going to be crammed with ideas about that. So what you have to do is accept that and accept the, the supporting conditions and the tendency because of past actions, there's a, a, a habitual tendency towards worry. Uh, a memory arises, thing, something that hasn't been seen to, something that needs doing, a list that is uh, incomplete, a painful feeling comes with it. I've got to get rid of the painful feeling. It, we're giving it substance, we're giving it meaning, we're giving it value, and we've got to be able to go, oh, okay, so there's some thoughts and there's some feelings. If I continue the thoughts, it produces more feelings, which produces more thoughts. And so it goes round and round. And we've just got to relax into that and observe it and keep observing the fact it's never the same object. It's never the same mind that knows that object. It's always new. Okay. Or just don't move house. <laughs> Too late for that. <laughs> All right, yes. Wheels are in motion. I hope that I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, seeing that that quality, that you you're investing value in that quality by saying it shouldn't be there. You're giving it life. You're giving it meaning. You're giving it value. It's got no inherent value. It's utterly insubstantial as a quality. So the more you're able to just name it as it were, step back a little bit and just observe, you see that it is utterly insubstantial. And then will you continue doing the anxiety? Will you continue doing it? Who cares? Because once you've seen that it's insubstantial and it doesn't mean anything, it's not leading to anything. Because that's the thing, especially say anxiety, first thing in the morning, there's this overwhelming sense that something this anxiety is in relation to something real, and that real thing is doom laden. And, uh, you know, we feel the pressure. But the reality is, it isn't. It doesn't have that substance. We, it's just because we ignore it, we don't look at it, we act out of it. We're acting out the anxiety, we're acting out the frustration, we're acting out the irritation. We're not actually looking at it. So that's what you you have to remedy. If you do that, you see that, that all these things are insubstantial. And then you don't mind whether they come and go because they're included in the flow, the flow of conscious experience and all the, the this endless series of events, objects arising in our experience. We're gradually seeing that they all have that same nature. Whatever it is, it's empty of itself. Can you not see? <laughs> Who else has got a question? Thanks, Liz. Very good. Good evening. I don't have a question as such, but I found it very helpful, like the way you, um, in a way, guided us into the meditation. Like I found in the meditation, there was a lot of noise, like having quite a bit of family around at the moment. Some people watching telly, some people using the vacuum cleaner, some people talking loudly, coming down the stairs all that kind of stuff and it really helped me sort of to think hang on a minute it's not all wrong that there's noise it's not that I should know better than disturbing yeah. me yeah. it's it's just how it is and so an opportunity to practice so I found that really helpful absolutely perfectly put perfectly put if, if you if you adopt the attitude that you you are on the good way you 
your meditations are good. You are flowing towards whatever it is that you it is that you want. And if that is enlightenment or if that's deep states calm, irrespective, you start from a premise that everything is good and everything that happens is welcome and included. And it's all utterly empty and in, insubstantial also. It's it's us that nobody disturbs our meditation other than us. It's we alone that disturb our meditations. Not the guy with the pneumatic drill outside. He's just doing his job. He did... <laughs> Excuse me, could you do this that some other time? I'm meditating. That's not going to go down very well, is it? <laughs> So, no, we, we disturb ourselves through our passionate craving for things to be different than they are. If you start from the premise that, no, no, I'm, I'm heading towards my goal. Every, every meditation I do, I start with, oh, this is going really well. <laughs> this is just going really well. I'm doing what I need to do. Everything is gradually calming down. Yet, yes, there are disturbances. And this is something else, which is like, do the least possible amount of work you can. We have a, outside my office window, it looks down on the number nine garden lawn, and there is the edge of the lawn which goes follows the pavement. And nobody, it seems, knows how to cut that line straight. So I've taken it upon myself, that's now my responsibility to um, keep that, well, first of all, get that edge of lawn to be straight properly straight in harmony with the pavement in harmony with the rest of the garden and so what I do is like every few days I look out of my window from my office I'm exactly in front of that line and I can see it and I can see where all the wobbles are and so I just look at the line and I just like look at what is the the most outstanding bit of grass which is the, the innermost bit that needs to grow out and which is the bit which is outmost, which is sticking out that needs to... And I literally just, every few days, I just go and cut a very few pieces of the edge of the lawn every few days. And gradually, it all straightens up over time. That's how we should meditate. Literally, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. Oh, I started thinking about Brazil for some reason. Okay, note that. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's all good. Everything that's happening is... So you only ever deal with the extreme where the, where the mind has properly gone off. Then you use energy to bring it back. Other than that, you just leave it. You let it be whatever it wants to be. And that's a faith issue. Because we go, there's no way, there's no possible way, if I'm not in completely 100% involved, that this meditation is going to work. If I just sit here do, apparently doing nothing and just dealing with the, the most extreme sort of imbalance of the mind, then it's not going to go anywhere. And that attitude is how you end up with a lawn edge that goes like that. Because you're fussing, you're fussing, you're getting involved, you're fussing, you're fussing, you're getting involved rather than just standing back, letting it all hang out, <laughs> letting it go this way, let it go that way, let it go this way, let it go that way, noting what happens, noting what happens. If something really takes you away, like entering properly into a hindrance, when you become aware of it, then you, you note it and go, right, great, okay, this is where I get to use energy. This is where I get to bring the mind back. Yeah? And I tell you what you have a lot nicer meditations as a result and and gradually your lawn edge becomes straight that makes sense yeah i think one thing that i also found that helped me um sort of getting uh, like finding it easier to allow my mind to actually not constantly want to do something is I always had that idea in my mind 
in comparison with other meditators, I'm a rubbish meditator. And having that in, idea in my mind just doesn't allow me to just watch because it always feels as if I need to do something in order not to be the rubbish meditator anymore. And I've been able to let that go a little bit and I find that so much helpful. <laughs> yeah, why not let it go completely? Because you can't possibly know the minds of other meditators. Well, there is one way you could know the mind of other meditators, and that's being so good at meditation that you can, you know the mind of other meditators. But apart from that, we can't possibly know where somebody else is at. And so we told ourselves a little lie, and we believed it. We literally just made it up. It's, a, it's confabulation. We've just confabulated this story about being the world's worst. I mean, in a sense, that's the whole problem, because what it's doing is reinforcing the sense of myself. Mm. Whereas when we're just watching things arise and pass away, when that self-referencing just does, isn't there, it just doesn't have to be there. So it's a subtle trick of the ego to say, well, I'm still justifiably here as an ego because I am calling myself the worst. If I was calling myself the best, then obviously that would be completely ridiculous and out of order. But to call myself the worst, there's a kind of honour in that. There's a kind of virtue in being the worst. But it's just another trick. And it's, it's a, why is it any more reasonable or allowable or truthful to say I'm the world's worst and everyone else is better at meditation than me than it is to say, oh, this meditation is going well. You know, I'm quite good at this. I quite enjoy it you get a completely different set of results. I mean, so I absolutely agree. Birgit, I, I agree entirely. And you're heading down the right path. You are, because you're seeing that it's it's the self-referencing and the comparing which is tripping you up, which is a great thing to see. And sort of assuming that it could be different from what it is now, rather than sort of looking at how things are. Yeah, the infinite mystery should be different. It should be a different infinite mystery. This infinite mystery. <laughs> and that's the thing, because we, we don't associate things like, I don't know, so, so just something so normal and usual and humdrum as, I don't know, just brushing your teeth or something. You, we, unless we, we train our minds to not to assume, then we just assume that that's a boring, regular thing. There's nothing special there. But the more you practice mindful observation of all the elements that go to make up a mundane experience like that, you begin to see how extraordinary this all is. Yeah. So, yeah, so we've just got to get ourselves out of the way a little bit. Well, completely. <laughs> and then we start to not make that mistake anymore, which is to assume that there are, there are no ordinary moments. There are no ordinary moments. Oh, I won't go on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Birgit. Yeah, that's really great observations. Thank you. No, there are no ordinary moments. And you think what that means in terms of your desires in the world, when the more you realize that, that just relaxing into the moment and letting things be, and the infinite mystery is expressing itself through the, the sun, dappled sun, sunlight, through the apple tree, then the and the, the breeze against your face and the smell of the freshly cut grass. It's all just the infinite mystery expressing itself in these ways, but you can't see it as infinite mystery because of self-fear. Not just self-fear in terms of, oh, of me, but believing that there is a self in anything, that it, it's a self-existing entity. But when, when you crack open that, that flimsy um, perceptual 
layer and you go and you go in with insight you explode that idea that that these are self-existing entities and are therefore boring and unknown and suddenly they become infinitely unknown and unknowable and there's this, this wonderful quality that emerges that you hadn't seen because well for the reasons that i've stated at which point the most humdrum normal experience becomes exquisite and we get tastes of it everyone gets little tastes of it and something in everyone knows this is the case but we just so what does that mean in terms of our desires what does that mean in terms of of um being happy with little content with little means everything so like by giving up the world you get the world back but now it's transformed and you you're seeing it as it truly is so any renunciation so you know it's like and that's the happy truly the happiness that everyone is seeking isn't that weird it's just there as you're lying on the grass as the breeze crosses your your face and the dappled light passing through the the leaves of the apple tree and the clouds scudding past and you realize oh this is the happiness i i was always looking for this is the the fulfillment i was always looking for i didn't need that extra that and that and that and that and so you become ever more content with with little and what you have and you realize that the, the happiness is implicit it's not something to be discovered it's not something to be found what well, is to be discovered it's not something to be manipulated it's not something to be weaved into existence it's it exists and can only be understood and discovered when we stop all those manipulations stop acting out of all those desires stop acting out all the of you know trying to get rid of the anxiety and the frustration and the irritation and whatever else yeah. it's stopping when you stop, when you really properly stop, then you discover the infinite mystery. Or the infinite mystery is what remains, because there's no you who discovers it. And so that's the, pur that's the purpose of the insight training. The purpose of the insight training is to show you the insubstantiality of existence. Not the, it doesn't mean anything-ness, because it, it is deeply, profoundly meaningful but not just not in the way you think. So you, you are letting go of renouncing through seeing the insubstantial, empty, transient, ungraspable nature of reality again and again and again and again. Like I say, not a not hundred times, not a thousand times, a hundred thousand times. In every component part of a conscious experience, you just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. And gradually it's wearing away the sense in which life should be different than it is. Roland, thank you. I can stop waving my hands about. How are you, sir? How thank you, I? Paul. Good evening. Um, I have a curiosity, really. I, I, I know um, the way we follow isn't based on faith, and we investigate a lot, and we look for things to find out the truth before, behind them. Um, a curiosity about universal laws, some of which are self-evident, like there are mother and father, well, obviously, Otherwise, I wasn't here. There are teachers. Um, the one that gets me is uh, actions have results. I, I, I'm, I believe it's true, but I believe it's true just as a blind faith. I, I, I haven't personally ever sort of seen the results of it. Yes, I have bad things happened in my life and I can say to myself, I was inefficient in the past. But is there a way to find out? that it's absolutely true or is there evidence that you know of or is it just a case of I just have to accept it as a, as a blind faith that actions have results? You mean blind belief? Faith is... Blind, blind belief, yeah. It's different. Um, well, on two counts. Firstly, a very, very simple way of discovering whether... Well, firstly, you have to know what is the result? What do we mean by Kama Wapaka? So what do we mean by karma? So there are actions. Those actions may be out and out selfish actions based in greed, hatred, and delusion, or they might be 
relatively selfless actions based in non-greed, non-hatred and non-delusion. So a very simple way of discovering the nature of action and result. So we experience the results of actions through the kinds of sense contacts ar that arise, the kinds of feelings that arise upon those sense contacts and the kinds of perceptions that arise on those sense contacts. So if you perform out and out um, unskillful, selfish actions, the kinds of sense contacts that arise produce painful feelings and unwanted perceptions, either about ourselves or how the world sees us or whatever it might be. But we, we experience those kinds of resultants. If the actions are relatively selfless, they're skillful, the kind of sense contacts that arise are um, productive of pleasant feelings and much wanted perceptions. A very easy way to discover whether actions have results, therefore, is to practice something like loving kindness meditation. And if somebody practices loving kindness, then they are performing actions. They are consciously thinking about a being, thinking about their good qualities and wishing them well. And if you do that for even a short period of time, what kind of sense contacts are arising in immediate succession? What kinds of feelings? What kinds of perceptions? Well, if you're practicing loving kindness, pleasant feelings arise and a sense of um, healthy self-regard can arise. The perception of the, the people that you, you think, think about, were you to then meet them, your perception would be much wanted perception. Is that, I like this person, I want to go and speak to them. There will be pleasant feelings. You're experiencing the results of your actions. Actually, yes, that's that's a very helpful answer because I, I didn't I didn't look at it as a short term thing, but yes, that is a good way to find out because certainly, you know, when I think about <laughs> murdering somebody, I don't feel very good afterwards. And if I think no. if I do no. meta, I feel quite good. I suppose the question I was asking was, how do I know something I did in a previous lifetime? But I'm never going to find that out. But I I I, I see oh, what you're yes, saying. For the short thing. term, yes, it's very good. But you can, under, you can come to understand condition-dependent origination, the 12 links of condition-dependent condition dependent origination, explain the process whereby past actions produce present results, present actions produce future results. You only, you only have to see that process twice to understand rebirth. What I mean by that is you, you, you have to see that, that the present supporting conditions are producing these resultants now, right? And then you see at a further point that the actions you performed at that point are now producing another set of results. You don't have to know which, re which actions lead to which results. You just have to see the process more than once. And then you say, oh, right, okay. So I know from my own experience that there are past actions. I know from my own experience there are present results. I know from my own experience that there are present actions. And I know from my own experience that there are future results because I've experienced the whole process. Yeah. yeah. A little bit at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, you have to see it twice, but you have to see it twice 100,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the point. Yeah. So that's very helpful, actually. Yes, yes. Nothing is hidden. No, nothing is hidden. I mean, the other the other way around that is to develop your concentration to such a point that you can revisit your past lives. <laughs> but even even within this lifetime, we know that the actions that we've taken have have produced results. You know, I mean, I look back over the last what over twenty years of my life, being you know, completely committed to this teaching and this center and help trying to help people. My life's wonderful. <laughs> my, life is, my life is wonderful. It didn't used to be wonderful. It used to be horrible. So in my own estimation. So, you know, so it's like looking back, just 
in a lifetime you you can see how our actions produce results if if you care to does that help Roland? yes it, it does actually because I, I was looking at it too long term and i needed to yeah. just pull it back to doing a bit at a time but once yeah. you've once you've established the the mechanics of the process you can see it in all three um time frames you can yeah. see it from moment to moment which is why we practice we in our in order to see the process of action and result in moment to moment terms you then understand that set its wheels within wheels you then understand that process in terms of this lifetime you then understand the, the exactly the same process in terms of from life to life yeah it's exactly the same cyclical process thank you thank you good thank you for that such an amazing teaching buddha tamma such an amazing teaching is anybody mark hello hi paul um yeah, I think you saying it's such an amazing teaching with such passion made me put my hand up. Um, just talking about the hindrances, if for me it's always been doubt. You know, um, I mean, I first came to center a long time ago, and 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 it's uh, and without a doubt, it's been I've had. It's been the most impactful teaching on my life, but I always leave it. I always leave it. I always leave it and then go on to some other spiritual practice. And I do a rotation. But that rotation is is just getting quicker. It's, 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 getting, it's just getting right to the centre now. And I'm back here. I'm back here. And I, and I just think, well, what? I know at some point doubt is going to come along and I'm going to be off again. And yet, wow. and yet, the, the 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 most results I've ever had are, are from this t teaching. Okay, uh, and, and probably the, the most profound thing is something you said to me once on retreat. And but I still go off. Okay, well that it's down to you, Mark. It, you, uh, the only person who who can change that pattern is you, and it it's not as difficult as you think because you're you're already noting the doubt you're doubting it i mean you're you're noting it in hindsight it's retrospective but it still qualifies it's noting the doubt as doubt and including it so it's it's disbelieving the doubt it's it's acknowledging the doubt it's acknowledging the doubtful thoughts as doubt and it's learning to devalue to take out the 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 substance so it's like well i've had a doubt therefore i have to just run off and go to somewhere else and try something else no no you don't you have to note the doubt and if you're willing to do that you'll break the cycle absolutely and but you know i think what what it is it's i it because i don't do i don't sustain the practice i start doing it and I get a lot of pain. I get a lot of painful feelings, and then I'm off because I want it easy. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is just fessing up. I want it easy, and uh, you know, I, I get uh, so, so I go off, and then I come back. And, yeah, it's incredible. It's an incredible cycle. Well, it's it seems to me that um, yeah, that the you know the, the cycle will continue you see what the issue is painful feelings are as much uh, an integral part of the way in which the infinite mystery displays itself as anything else but because of the strong identification with feelings as being me or mine or myself or them being you know substantial and meaningful and uh, the rest of it including pleasant feelings seeing pleasant feelings as being extraordinarily meaningful, um, then you will act on that doubt. Yeah. 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 So, Gu I'm guilty of all of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, changing the narrative 
out of guilty of that too. Yeah, I can see that's happening. Yeah, <laughs> that's helpful too, because we need to re- we need to remove as much of the burden as we can, as much of the sense in which something is wrong, the sense in which something is wrong. So in your narration of your situation, you're narrating it as though something were wrong. Nothing is wrong. Mm-hmm. It's just this is the things that you're seeing, and you're just reacting on them. And you know, and if so, it's it's learning to identify. Well, you have you have identified what the issue is. So it's it's a, it's about choosing not to act on that in you know on that impulse. I and mean, I'm not saying it's easy, <laughs> but then I'm not asking anyone to do any anything I haven't done. So it's it's in, entirely doable. But it's it's being willing to devalue the importance and significance that you attach to feelings. Yes. And to doubt. So, so the doubt comes out of the experience of the painful feelings. So if you deal with the devaluing the painful feelings and the, and the attachment to the pleasant feelings, then it's possible to recognize the doubt and not act upon it. And then the question is, well, this, it becomes a bit circular because then we say, well, how do you devalue attachment to feelings? Well, through seeing they're transient, of course. <laughs> so, so at, at some point, I was going to say at some point you ha- you have to just leap in, but you do leap in. This is the thing: you are learning. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can clearly um, uh, express what the issue is. It's just at the time it's probably feels all consuming, and uh, you know that's fair enough. So it it just requires repeated exposure. If that means going around the track a few more times, then I mean, how many times have we been been around the track anyway? If you take rebirth into account, so you know, yeah. as you're saying that, it, it feels like an attachment to suffering. Uh, I don't know something about that resonates with me. I don't know why, but like that's all I'm looking for. But, that, but that's very helpful. It's very helpful seeing the, the, the way I put on the painful feelings, not just the doubt. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we look for the cessation of suffering through the production of pleasant feelings. And if we're feeling pleasant feelings, we're not suffering. But the loss of pleasant feelings is painful. And so we have to... We have to then... We're, we're then caught in the trap because then we have to produce more painful feelings and that uh, sorry more pleasant feelings and that's why we constantly give significance to feelings because if feeling is your vehicle to realize freedom from suffering the loss of pleasant feelings is 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 enslavement isn't it if if only we could keep if if only we could keep pleasant feelings you know that's that, that whole thing of like you know, if it's sunny every day, in the end, you don't notice that it's sunny. And so there is a, a definite devaluation that occurs when we don't see, tra- when we don't see that, that um, you know, we don't see any variation or, or alternative. So, you know, but we can't, that's the problem. We can't sustain pleasant feelings. They're always going to let us down. That's absolutely fundamental and central to the Buddha's teaching. That's why he he took feeling as a mental component and made it its own aggregate. Mm. Because it's so significant. People treat feelings with such significance. Yeah. In the wrong way. Because they because they don't see that feelings are suffering. They treat feelings as the vehicle to the cessation of suffering. Mm. There's not a lot of pleasant feelings going on. I'm not, I, I, I can't remember many pleasant feelings lately. But, um, so, yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah. I... But when you consider the Buddha's teaching, what kind of feelings do you get then? When you... I, I, do, I, I, I tell you what, what, and I'd referred to it earlier, you know, being on retreat and you saying something to me that literally blew my mind. It, 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 that resounds with me. Uh, and that takes me to the thing as if you find a teacher who makes you more mindful or, you know. So that I respond to. And I think this, you know, 
and, and no matter how many books, you know, the, the books don't do it. You know, I, I know that it's, it's just sitting and I don't know. It, it, it's almost like a fessing up, but you you know it anyway because you've seen me. I've turned up so many times, but you know. <laughs> and you're welcome to turn up as many times as you need. It's you know, it's like again, it it's the pressure we place on upon ourselves. It's like you are on the you are on the path. We can't. No, nobody can ever say where they really where they are. Maybe somebody can know that they, you know that they're reaching the end of a particular insight path or whatever. But generally speaking, it's like. <laughs> I mean, I have to remind people when they're on retreat that you're on retreat. You, you're doing it. You're doing the work. You know, you're you're actually in, engaging with the Buddhist teaching in a really deep and meaningful way. You're not trying to take shortcuts. You're not trying to. It's not escapism. You know, it's a, this is the reality check, and you're doing the work. That puts you ahead of ninety nine point nine nine recurring percent of human beings currently on this planet. People aren't doing this. They're on the streets protesting or they're, you know, trying to get their kicks here and there or they're, they're trying to become what they think will make them happy. And we're all, at whatever level, each one of us is beginning to see through that. And I, and I think one of the issues is we just don't see it in a, with a long, long enough lens. Yeah. We don't see it in terms of what we've done in previous lives. We're you know, very much concentrated on what we're doing in this lifetime. We're all trying to learn lessons <laughs> in some way, shape or form. And some of us have become conscious of the fact that this is go what's going on. Yeah. So I think just putting it into a wider context. Yeah. If, if I think of one thing, say, from the beginning, you know, when I first came into the teaching, I see it now. It was all I was creating was some spiritual ego. You know, that, that was all it was. But so I see that. Yeah. To be honest, I've seen that quite a lot with people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and we're going to see, because that's what, that's what people are like, and, and people are going to try whatever they can, whatever shortcut, whatever way of realising freedom from suffering without actually looking at the problem of suffering. You know, so people will prance about in funny hats, claiming they're this, that, and the other. <laughs> that's such a bit cruel. But people will put on the act, that you know they'll put on the act and and like say all the right things, sound like they know, and they'll give that a good old go until such time as they realise they're no happier than they were. I mean, you you can kid yourself and kid yourself and kid yourself, and then finally, I mean that's what happened with me. It's like that I don't know what I'd done in previous lives, no idea, but whatever it was at the age of what, well, yeah, sort of twenty. 9 30 ish or something i realized that it it was my own ignorance which was the problem <laughs> and there was no getting away from it it took me a few more years before i met alan but as soon as i met alan i'd found my way and i found my teacher and i would found the right the right path and so I, I just rolled up my sleeves and got on with it really because i because because there's a point at which no other, nothing else is, is viable anymore. You know, not putting on the act, not a bigger house, not another partner, you know. Absolutely. And I'm complete, that's completely where I am. Well, I'm 57, but so it's a little bit later, but um, yeah, it, older it, it happens when it happens. You've still got your marbles though, Mark, and that's the, that's the most important thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so look, you know, it it's got to come. Ultimately, it's got to come from within. It's it's got to be the call. What the Alan called the call of the beyond. For me, it just started just calling like really loudly, and I couldn't sort of dim the noise, and so I had to act on it. And and it's for everyone. I think it just reaches a point where you understand there is no viable alternative. And for you, from what you said, it sounds like it means having to go through this process of finally looking at painful feelings, acknowledging them, accepting them, allowing them, and beginning the process of really properly seeing that they're transient. And each time that voice within says, no, go on, run away, go off and do X, Y, or Z, that's where the renunciation has to come in. That's where the faith has to come in. 
you know, that's where, that's why practicing the parami is so important. That's why helping other people is so important because that that's, gives you the strength to be able to go against that strong habitual sense in which I just have to act out of this habit or repeatedly. Yeah. That's what, you know, so it's, it's partly, it's partly, yes, having the fortitude and the determination to, to stick, well, it is completely the fortitude and determination to stick with it, but things like the Buddha's mundane teaching are what provides, and actually, you know, practicing the parami is what actually gives you that, you know, that spiritual strength to be able to withstand the habitual, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. And you. Anybody like to add anything? Anything you'd like to talk about? Or we could have an early night. All for that. David. No, you have to unmute, my friend. Um, I, I, I know I've already asked the question, so it's not really a question, it was more an observation. Mm -hmm. But I did uh, really enjoy what you just said to Mark then as well, because I think some of us feel looking at confident members of the, the group that they're, they're on a, you know, they're further ahead than we are. And we look at ourselves and think we're coming back and we're not making progress and going through the same sort of similar process of doubt. And it's, I think it's, it takes quite a lot of bravery to admit that in front of a big group of people. And I thought your advice was really good for that as well, because I suffer similar things sometimes, you know, kind of going away, coming back, yeah. sort of doubt. And it is good to hear other people expressing that and then for you to talk them through it. I found that really helpful as well. Yes. I mean, the comparison kills you, doesn't it? Yeah. And yet it's it, it's, an, it's a comparison built on assumptions. You know, like, we can't know what really, even me as, as a teacher, I mean, I, I certainly don't know what goes on in other people's lives. I mean, people tell me stuff, but you don't know, you don't really know what all the pressures are and, and you know, all the, the things that they have to consider, which allow, you know, which still allows them to get to a retreat or still allows yeah. them to come on a Wednesday evening or still allows them to join a, a Zoom meeting, you know. So I, I have to be very respectful that I don't know all the conditions that are going on in somebody's life, whether they're external conditions or internal conditioning and ideas and thoughts about. So, but I'm a great believer in, in, in the idea that things are all working out for the best, no matter how it seems on the surface. And I know that for some people, you know, doubts are really like strong and, and the doubts are being created through this comparison with other people. And I mean, that's why I don't try to put on airs and graces. That's why I, I, I just, you know, if you want to have a chat about the football, I'm all for it. Because I I got this sense when I arrived at the centre that Alan and, and, and Jackie and Jackie's memory were held on this pedestal that was so high that people felt it wasn't attainable for them. And my certain knowledge is, is that it's attainable for everyone because it is your intrinsic nature. It's just the discovery of your intrinsic nature. And that everyone has their battles to go through in order to discover it, but you are all perfectly entitled to it. It is yours. It is, it is, it's, it's, your, it is your true home. It is your true heritage. It is who you really are or what you really are. And, and so the way I try to um, engage is by bringing that level down so you can see that, no, I don't have to be a superhuman. I don't have to be a super confident, spiritual, angelic, bewinged god or goddess. <laughs> As if anyone could be that. But you see what I mean? It's like... You can just be you. Yeah, I think, I mean, when you explain talking to Mark then really helped me as well, because 
I suffer often from a sort of similar frustrating cycle of kind of coming to centre, then not coming for a while, then practising, then, and it's sort of, you sort of feel like, ah, I'm, I'm not making any progress at all. And then, you know, it, it's it's good to hear that. And yet, and yet I would say you are, in, in the sense that, yes, you, you're having to go around that particular cyclical pattern again yeah. and again, but you're wearing it down <laughs> I mean, to the point where you won't be able to take it seriously anymore. Yeah, I mean, it does, obviously it helps kind of talking about it as well because you sort yeah. of yeah you are on you are on the path yeah you you when you meditate you do meditate yeah it's not you i'm trying to get it right it is no i am i am meditating i am doing it yeah. and yes i'm learning my lessons as i go along but i'm doing it and it's so it's the same. i mean you live at a distance from the center that's yeah that is always difficult for people who live you know that's why we've taking it upon ourselves yeah. to, to meet every fortnight because yeah. it, it gives people a helping hand. It gives you the reminders. Hopefully it gives you some inspiration to, yeah. to continue to practice every day. Yeah. You know, and it does get easier. But as you get older, you, you realize the, the things that when you were younger, you've tried to sort of go down to distract you, you realize that they don't work. And that's yeah. the benefit of age because you try everything and you still end up back at the teaching going, actually it is probably the only thing that's going to solve the problems that you suffer from you know so that is I suppose <laughs> the wisdom of age but it, it's it's still it's good I think it's nice when you hear people talking about the frustration of it and then you can talk it really helps me as well so thank you for that teaching this oh evening. thanks thanks Dave and yeah I'll just say keep going you know yeah. in, in whatever way keep going means to you <laughs> yeah. and gradually it gets ironed out it gets yeah. it gets resolved thank you that's really I inspirational think. yeah, yeah. Thanks. Not at all. Hmm. Yeah. The first path is the most challenging path of the four Upasana paths, the insight paths, because of the doubt. The, the fetter of doubt, they call it skeptical doubt, I think it's more like existential doubt <laughs> that causes us to behave in all kinds of particular ways, which then create this, this real, almost, almost impossible kind of matrix of, of doubt and self-concern and worry and about, because it, because it's, it's at that stage, it's all about how, either how I perceive myself or how the world perceives me. So the, the fetter of personality belief, one's persona. It's not about actually dealing with greed and hatred at that level. It's about what greed and hatred mean to me. How, how will other people perceive me if I'm greedy or hateful? Or... And so that, that creates this um, somewhat vacuous um, display of virtue that people go in for where virtue is seen is is someone's virtue is displayed because of their inner uncertainty about the true nature of existence the, the true nature of virtue the true nature of you know good and bad and and so forth and so that this creates this really difficult web of interrelated issues creating rules and views and ways of behaving in the world to ensure my, my, my moral worth, that I'm a good person. And um, then, we, then people tend to project those onto others and say, well, you, you're bad because you're not behaving by the rules that, that I, I'm using to anchor myself in the world. And you've got to get through all of that <laughs> to get to the first fruition. And, and so that's, so those three things, fetter of personality belief, fetter of rule and ritual, the fetter of existential doubt, if you want to call it that, they're the things that prevent movement through the insight knowledges. They're the things that keep getting in the way, keep getting in the way. Uh, so it, that's why the first path is the most difficult path to get through. Once somebody has had their first glimpse, they've they've gone through the super mundane path and fruition stream winning. Everything changes from that point. Uh, well, it's changed a lot before that point because you've done so much work to get to that point. That, um, 
but that first path is the most difficult path to get through undoubtedly and for the reasons that that, that Dave and Mark have been stating I, I come across it so much with students and yet weirdly once the student is through that fruition that doubt it's like it's never existed it's it's amazing to behold um someone who's gone through that liminal phase between uh, working on the stream winning path and having to deal with all these fetters of the fetters that I've enumerated and then being beyond it and then not never discussing it ever again you know it's, it's kind of kind of amazing so but that's the path that's the path you know um and but once you're through that things I was going to say get easier but then you start working on the greed and hatred proper <laughs> But no, you're assured from that point on, you're assured of final knowledge, final realisation. So it's well worth persevering with, well worth persevering with. And if anyone at any time needs just a little, have a chat in order to just reconnect with, you know, whatever their inspiration was to practice in the first place, you're very welcome to get in touch. All right. Well, let's call it a day there. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. It's been great. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.